Hi, everyone. Welcome back to our podcast from the Kama Sutra to 2020, where we look at your questions, your concerns, even your worries around all things to do with sex and sexuality. As always, we have with us Dr. Anvita Madan Behel. Anvita, as you know, is a psychosexual therapist and she brings the psychological perspective to the advice that the Kama Sutra has to give. But we're very, very lucky to also have with us Dr. Nivedita Manokaran. Um, Nivedita is a sexual and reproductive health clinician based in Sydney, but she's our guest today because she is our resident expert on contraceptions and STIs. Nivedita, welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Seema. It's an absolute pleasure to be on board with you. Anvita and I have been wanting to cover this subject for a while. So um, we're really pleased to have the expert with us. STIs is something that we never speak about. And it is one of the hardest subjects for people to discuss because, um, you know, if you don't talk about sex, the fact that we might be having a burning or an itching or, you know, uh, boils, anything in our vagina or penis is, is a really tough conversation to go to a doctor and speak about or even tell friends and family, right? Like it's itching, where is it itching, you know? So just the conversation is so difficult. Um, but sure. sometimes very difficult even to go to the doctors to ask for medicine. True. Mm-hmm. See, I mean, I really want to, I have this question that people ask me all the time, Anvita. They say, why aren't doctors so sex positive? Or why aren't doctors very open about this? Why is it so difficult? They make us feel embarrassed. And I always tell people that, you know, we have to understand, especially I think we're talking about doctors in India, that we are also people of the same culture. We also grew up in the same background and we grew up, you know, understanding that sex is a tabooed word or we are not supposed to use that word. And I think being a part of that culture, being a part of that community does not make us think any different then because this is what I want people to understand. And unfortunately, our medical degrees don't teach us otherwise either. It's not like when one person becomes a doctor, they're teaching us in our medical qualification that talking about sex is okay. You know, I have like personally experienced that I got trained in India as a venereologist and, you know, I, we were very good in clinical skills. We were great in treating people. But what they didn't genuinely teach us is to how to have a non-judgmental attitude. You know, how when you're having a young person come to you, what is important to ask her the right questions. We were never taught. So I think that is what I have learned when I have moved to a different country and got myself qualified, you know, as a sexual and reproductive clinician here. What I've learned is you have certain questions that you have to ask. Like, for example, when you see a youngster, rather than rolling your eyes, you want to know if her sex was forced or not, because you're trying to rule out sexual assault. You're trying to rule out, you know, sexual abuse. And we missed that as clinicians because I wasn't taught to do it. Not because how come doctors are, because doctors are also part of the community. And if they are not taught, they don't know either. So that was so those kind of things, you know, asking the girl, you're having sex and you have an STI. So it means your boyfriend needs treatment as well. Where is he? You know, that kind of a question. And the second thing is, if you're having sex, how are you protecting yourself from falling pregnant? So all these important questions were never taught to us. See, I think now we have grown very far. Like even in India, I think a lot of us are able to talk about the word sex. You know, and a group of women sitting on social media and actually pinning this down is a big development. It's a big, you know, growth. And I like to tell people you just have to be patient because a lot of us have started this um, journey of changing things. You know, I really want to approach medical colleges and try to tell people that this has to be part of a learning curve. You have to teach doctors how to actually do it because it just doesn't come naturally to most people um so yeah so i think that was point actually yeah that's a really really good point and i was going to share a story to move into our next question with it i struggle with thrush now and then in everything especially when i get ill and most recently i had a bout of it and i needed to go and get the vaginal suppositories or something 
But the neighborhood chemist is a South Asian man who I have now been frequenting with medicines and everything. The thought of me going to him and asking for vaginal suppositories was the worst thing. In my head, I was thinking, which booths can I go to where somebody doesn't know me? Where can I no. go and ask? So despite me being a sexual health educator, being comfortable, talking about sex, as soon as I know somebody, somebody one degree separated, you know, like an uncle or bhaiya or whatever the chemist, yeah. Yeah. I still can't do it. So we understand how difficult or culturally ingrained it is. Like yeah. I can't go and ask him for medicine for the for yeast infection. So yeah. with that, let's talk about yeast infections uh, or commonly known as thrush. Um, so do you just want to give us top five points on it and what yeah. it is? Yeah. Absolutely. So I just want to start off by saying all vaginal discharges are not necessarily STIs. And I think that's what is very important because the minute people start having vaginal symptoms or, you know, vaginal discharge, uh, redness, irritation and burning. And if they're sexually active individuals, the first thing they're probably freaking out or panicking is thinking that they have uh, STI. They tend to self-diagnose, they tend to freak out, you know, and all of those things. So I want to tell people that thrush is a very, very common vaginal um, infection. It's called vulvovaginal infection. It can be both outside in the vulva as well. It can be inside the vagina as well. And it's not an STI. So I think that's what's something we have to know. Um, just because people talk about it in the vagina, like you know how you said, you know, you're worried. What are people going to say? Because I'm asking for something to put in the vagina. And I think that's what is important to understand is it's not an STI and not all vaginal issues have to be sexually transmitted. So that is very important to know about it. And thrush also is very common in women more than men because thrush loves your estrogen. Uh, so it is, you know, a very estrogen friendly fungus actually that grows in. So a lot of the thing that makes you grow the fungus actually grows it. Like, for example, when people are having unprotected sex and, you know, sperm is rich in protein. And when you have a protein medium sitting in there, people tend to grow the thrush if they have a tendency to have thrush. So if you notice people saying, I get thrush every time me and my partner have sex you know so if that's the case sometimes I do check do you use a condom if not why try, why not try and using one you know so that you don't you're not pooling that you know protein um, sperm in the vagina for it to grow the thrush you know things like that so it's very important thrush symptoms can be pretty dramatic you know it can be red and swollen and itchy with burning uh we and you also can have like a cheesy thick white discharge so when you're having all of these things definitely go and see a doctor you know i always tell people don't self-diagnose because we tend to we tend to google we tend to find symptoms and self-diagnose i definitely would tell whatever the symptom is see a medical practitioner and get it checked out and the most important bit is if you were freaking out that it is an STI, it means you've been sexually active and you are worried that it is an STI. So it's time for an STI screen. So I think you definitely have, something has clicked in your brain, even though it was thrush. So it's very important to go and get tested for other STIs while you're having thrush as well. So they do a swab for thrush and tablets, there are oral tablets. And, you know, like Anvita said, there are pessaries, there are vaginal creams. The treatment is pretty easy. You can use things up to a day to seven days. And yeah, it goes away. Very important. And last point about thrush is recurrence. Coming back again and again is common. So there's no need to freak out. And, you know, usually it can be frustrating, guys. Sometimes it can be really frustrating. And what is important is to just do repeated treatment. It is, that is why it's important to get tested, because sometimes your treatment may not be working. You may be using the same cream over and over and it's not going away, maybe because the type of thrush you have is resistant to the cream or the antifungal that you're using. So if you get a swab test by from a doctor, it tells you, you know, what antifungals you could be sensitive to and then using the right medication and then getting treated is very important so don't get frustrated and um yeah it's a very common thing and it's not an sti and so you said that men get it as well can you tell us more how it's seen in men see men don't get it as frequent as women do 
a lot of the times when men are getting what like they get this fungal infection at the head of the penis. Uh, you see this fungal infection more in men who are not circumcised, where thing, you know it's moist, where the fungus has space to grow in the moist. So that's very important. The most important factor, or sometimes when men have it, is either poor hygiene, they are not retracting their skin completely and cleaning and things like that. The second thing is when men become immunosuppressed or diabetic, Diabetic, uh, for example, because sugar is again one of you know great medium for growth. So when somebody is diabetic, they start having thrush and they grow thrush again and again. So diabetes is again one of those things that you have to rule out when someone is having you know recurrent chronic thrush and also at a particular age and have other risk factors for diabetes. It's very, very uncommon. There is no research, Anvita, which says that, you know, both the partners need to be treated for thrush. You know how for STIs, we say that both partners need to get tested and then treated and tested and not have sex for a period of time. It's not the same with thrush. However, there are some of us clinicians, you know, after trying all the things that we have tried, we do tend to give the partner the same cream and the treatment as well and say, you know, just in case there's a little bit there that's coming to you or something like that, mm -hmm. both of you use these creams and we'll see if that goes away. So we do tend to do partner treatment as a last resort, but there is no enough evidence and research that backs that every girl who has a partner you know, their partner needs to be treated as well for thrush. Yeah. So let's ask the basic question for all STIs. Is sex, mm -hmm. is having penetrative sex okay when you have thrush? And I can ask that for every STI that we speak about. See, like I said, thrush is not an STI and it makes a big difference when you are having sex, when you have an STI or not having an STI. Like for example, if you're having thrush, the chance that you're transmitting it is unlikely and we don't have to worry about it as we will be worried about when we're having gonorrhea or chlamydia or herpes or things like that. So when you're having stuff like bacterial vaginosis, which is again one of the other things where you can have a foul smelling discharge, but it is not an STI. You know, it is, uh, it's just an imbalance that is caused in the vaginal flora. And that's very important. And I think things like that it's a personal choice whether you want to have sex during that time or not. Like, for example, if it's really sore, it's really itchy, it's swollen, you won't be able to have sex, right? So I think if that's the case, then people with thrush don't have sex. But in all honesty, sometimes people have what we know call as asymptomatic thrush. They have a curdy discharge, but there's no itching, there's no swelling, there's nothing. This discharge is just there. It gets a little bit worse before your period because the estrogen is high. And then after your period, it actually goes away. So in that case, we don't even treat people who have asymptomatic thrush. So people can have a bit of fungal you know, thrush there, but not have any symptoms and not bother to treat. But they're also having sex. So yeah, actually, let I, me just I, jump I, in at this yeah. point, just to uh, because there was a, a question that came in a few weeks ago saying, um, if I have UTI, can I also have sex at that point? And I remember thinking, oh, my God, that's an absolute no, no. Now. On a personal level, if I have a UTI, I know how horribly burning it is down there. So exactly. I wouldn't want so you to. you want. Exactly. But basically, you're saying that a UTI is not necessarily an, a, a sexually transmitted infection. And hence, if the person wanted to, they could still go ahead with having sex. That's correct. Okay. Brilliant. That's so that's correct. a question answered. I'm very pleased Perfect. because that one was really kind of going around in my head yeah. a little bit. Yeah. And that yeah, is so what I I'm think going to ask. So, mm -hmm. so what we are leaving people with is that if it is uncomfortable, if it is painful, if it's swollen, it's itchy, and it it hurts while having sex, then please avoid. Please don't. Sex. Yes. So, yes. But you will. The risk of giving it to your partner, the UTI or the yeast infection, Crush low, or BV. Yeah, but but if you have sex and you have unprotected sex, then the sperm can increase the symptoms because of, like you said, the protein there. So just and maybe really, if you're going to have sex and, during and that also time, with the, it with a condom. Yeah, yeah, no, and also, you know, how we brought in the UTI fact 
yes, the, you, you won't be giving your partner the bug that has caused you the UTI because it's not a sexually transmitted infection. However, again, with the method of having sex, you know, by things getting pushed into the urethra or whatever contamination that's going to happen with this sexual encounter, it may probably worsen your symptoms of UTI that has already there. Do you, know, do you know what I mean? So yes, it is not a sexually transmitted infection, but when things have been, you know, really rough down there, sore down there, giving it a bit of a break is a good idea. Okay, so mm. I was just going to say, I have a feeling that the hero of this particular conversation is going to be the condom, but we'll come to it at the end. <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah, so I was just going to say that maybe both UTI yeast infections if you are deciding to have sex, use the condom because it will just, you know, feel much, it will not pass on things or make it, um, I'm just thinking it'll be more softer or more like less friction is what I'm thinking in my head. Well, I, well, I wouldn't, ag- sorry, I wouldn't agree necessarily that condom wouldn't cause, you know, friction because it does, it's rubber and it is, it does. See, what I would really tell people who are having, you know, UTIs or STIs and when they want like, sorry, or thrush or when they ha- want to have sex is, yes, you can use condoms because condoms do prevent the spread of certain infections. However, 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 use of a lubricant is probably the one that is going to make it smoother. So when you're using a condom, yes, it's, the friction is going to be more. In fact, for thrush, especially when people are having it all red and swollen, and irritated, if you're pouring down like a whole lot of a water-based lubricant, then your sex is actually going to be less painful and much pleasant. And same with the UTI. Rather than thrusting and rubbing it even with a condom if you tend to use a good lubricant and keep it as smoother and easier as possible then the tendency of pushing things into things or causing infections is less likely so i think lubricant is probably more the more the magical word to ease sex and to make sex smoother rather than the condom itself condom is more a preventary blanket that you can, you know, confidently use for many things for, to be honest, even like bacterial vaginosis and things like that. Like I told you, if you're using a lubricant for bacterial vaginosis, it's smoother. You know, when you don't have that smoothness and you're having the roughness rubbed inside the vagina, it destroys the vaginal flora. It destroys the lactobacillus, which is inside your vagina. And then that produces, you know, um, it, the lactobacillus is killed. You don't have any lactic acid there. So your acidic pH is lost. Then you start growing bugs that smell bad. And then it becomes like a cycle. You're thinking it smells bad. And usually you tend to wash or douche too much then you're killing more of the lactobacillus, then no more lactic acid, then it smells again, Uh, then it smells again. Um, Sorry, did I get cut out? Don't worry about it. Okay, Uh, So, uh, and then it smells again really bad, and then it's a vicious cycle with bacterial vaginosis. So if we're using a good lubricant that actually doesn't hurt or affect your vaginal flora as much, it actually reduces your chances of destroying that flora, destroying your healthy vagina and the lactobacillus. And in fact, it keeps it live and doesn't cause that kind of a smelly discharge and things like that. So actually lubricant is really underrated sexual accessory, which I think I'm a big, uh, you know, uh, go uh, advocate for it. So definitely, yes. So always We are as well. We've yes. done an entire set of episodes on this because we yes. are huge um, proponents <laughs> yes, of, fans the, of pleasure. That's right. Everything is better with lube. <laughs> That's right. I agree. I agree. Okay. So going to our next one, which I think is quite big, but let's try and cover it in this video, is herpes, which is a complicated one and a difficult one. So we'll start with the most complicated one. So just top few points on herpes and then, you know, the three of us can discuss discuss it further. Sure. So as I tell people, herpes is probably the longest consultation I have with my patients. More than herpes itself, it's the psychological effect that it is left with it. So I have certain tricks that I always tell my patients. So what I want people to know is herpes is common. 
it is as common as the common cold and grandparents grand aunts and you know so many people just carry it around their mouth when i'm saying that i'm talking about type 1 herpes which is very commonly called the cold sore um and because of a lot of oral sex and extensive oral sex that's happening we see the same type of type 1 herpes in people's genital area as well but because it's the genital her area we do have to classify it as genital herpes which somehow weirdly has a completely different effect to the fact that half or more than 50% of the population actually have herpes so i think again it comes down to the fact that when something is associated with the word sex it somehow feels more traumatic or more stigmatizing than the fact that it is around your mouth so this is what i want to tell people it's the exact same virus so as we are destigmatizing the word sex i think we have to focus on destigmatizing something that comes from your mouth from your mom or your aunt when they're kissing you as a child and you've acquired it let's just say shouldn't be so traumatic shouldn't be so dramatic so and i think that's how we're going to go and it's the exact same virus that comes in people's genital area there are two strains when it comes to genital area one and two and yeah i don't think either makes a big difference you know it behaves in the same way and that is very important the second point i want to tell people is the reason why people get worried about her herpes and freak out is because when they google about herpes i think the first thing that it tells them is you're going to have it for life and the minute they hear the word or read the sentence saying you're going to have some kind of an infection for rest of the, your life i think it's pretty traumatic for people when they actually read it and i think they are extremely you know they they're devastated that they almost feel like they're going to live with an sti for rest of their life but i think the truth is we all have viruses with which we live for rest of our lives and i want to tell people even people who have cold sores the virus is not going anywhere it is in the you know in your, in your spinal nerves and it is sitting there for rest of your life we go and get vaccinated for chickenpox these days and i want to tell people chickenpox is a virus which is exactly the same family as herpes it's called zoster and it stays in your body for rest of your life just in case people didn't know about it so i tell people you manually go and get yourself a vaccine and put a virus in your system which is going to last for rest of your life and the chickenpox virus comes out again exactly like how you have herpes outbreak you can have chickenpox outbreak as well and it's called shingles and you get it out when people have uh, you know immunosuppressed state and so this is something that we have been doing to our systems to our bodies in the name of chickenpox in the name of cold sores and we didn't care about it and we shouldn't care about it the minute it comes around our genitalia you know and i think that is what we have to understand here it's the exact same thing exact same thing you know you carry chickenpox for rest of your life yes and you will carry herpes for rest of your life And so can you share what are the symptoms and uh, what are the treatments? Yes. Right. So as we all understand covid herpes is again one of the viruses which behaves very much like covid. So you can have no symptoms. You can just purely carry the virus around you know your skin area that comes and goes and you can just give it to your sexual partners and that's possible as well. So that's very important to know. So you know when people say but i don't have any any symptoms or i don't feel like i have herpes i don't think i have given it to you that can't be true because you can transmit herpes asymptomatically and i want to be i want people to be aware of the fact that that could happen as well in coming to herpes symptoms they are these tiny uh, blisters that you see so what we see is it usually looks like water dew on rose petals you see like a red patch and then you see like tiny blisters around it. it's like a water dew and you can have those blisters anywhere around your genital area like in your buttock region your vagina your penis your vulva anywhere in the area in between anywhere the first episode is usually very painful because your body has not developed antibodies because that's the first time you're being exposed to it or you're having a first outbreak never talk to anyone about herpes or counsel them or you know do anything in their first outbreak because i think it's extremely painful 
and people are usually falling apart. So what I tend to do them is give them a lot of numbing cream like lignocaine, numb everything, a lot of analgesia, reassurance, bring them back even in a couple of days when things have settled down and then explain everything that I've you know, explain now because otherwise they are in too much agony. Very important, herpes will never come back so painfully again and again like your first episode. So when people get herpes for the first time and when they Google that it's going to be there for the rest of their life, what they're thinking is it's going to be this painful for the rest of their life. But that's not true. That's like, again, having chicken pox all over your body for the first time. But then when it comes back, it comes only in small, you know, blisters. Some people, it can come pretty often, depending on how their immunity is or the, uh, their body reacts to it. And for some people, you may not get herpes for years. People have it like once and they have said that they don't have outbreaks for like three years, four years. Lucky. But otherwise, some people can get it every time before a period and unlucky. There are fantastic treatment for herpes. Honestly, we don't have to worry about it at all. Uh, there's like, you know, there are two types of treatment. I would like to say one is where you suppress your virus and you make sure you don't get any outbreaks. You can take a tablet every day. So things like that are available. And sometimes when you know, like before my period, I want it only during the time, we can do medications only during the time. Or let's say if you're someone who's going to get it in about three years, you can carry the medication along and you may never use it. Uh, so herpes has all different kinds of options and treatments, which is so easy. And the medication is not like antibiotics. It's not like you're going to develop resistance or something like that. You, it's pretty friendly and you can use them well. One tip I want to give people who have herpes, whether it's you know cold sores or genital, is carry your antivirals when you're traveling you know especially when it's somebody's it, it always comes at a bad time guys when you're moving houses when you got exams when you got you know when you got somebody's wedding that's when things always pop up or pop up so in the in the best of times carry your herpes medications and i think that that will come very handy and can you have sex why do you have a herpes? So, that question. so when you're having herpes symptoms, you do not have sex because you're infectious and you're definitely spreading it to your sexual partner. So when people are having blisters or, you know, cuts or however your herpes symptom is painful, do not please have sex. Wait for it to heal, scab and go away and then you can have sex. Herpes, when you're having herpes, let's say your partner also has herpes but is not having an active episode. You having sex with him actually triggers for him or her to have an active episode. So it is, you know, sometimes I do have clients who come and tell me that, you know, but he already has herpes. So how does it matter? It kind of matters is one, because it's painful for you. Uh, and two is it can trigger an outbreak for him, which probably is unnecessary and you don't have to do that. So, yeah, so definitely when you're having symptoms, uh, ideally do not have sex at all, but let's say you're having it in your buttock and it's not going to really affect your sexual act and your partners really desperately want to have sex. I always recommend, even if you're regular partners who are not using condoms, definitely use condoms because with herpes, there's a lot of shedding, there's a lot of touching and rubbing. So the spread is definitely there. So definitely use a condom if that's what you decided to do. And what if when people are asymptomatic, because you said they can be asymptomatic, but have, uh, like, could they be having an episode of herpes and be asymptomatic then? Yes. Yes. Unfortunately, the answer to that question is yes. And I think that is the biggest cons consultation probably which you are going to have as well, Anvita, and which I have is then how do I know that I'm giving it to a partner? Or then how do I stop from giving it to other partners? And the anxiety causes is immense. But the bottom line is, I think, again, we have to go to my first statement where I said it is a common virus. It is a common cold. And unfortunately, guys, like COVID, we really cannot stop spread of some viruses and I think we are at a time and era we just have to accept that you know if you're exposed to it and if you feel like you know could I spread herpes on times when I don't have symptoms honest truth is yes yes but yes you can use a condom it prevents the spread of any STI up to 80 percent so if you people are really worried about it you can do that 
Uh, and in all honesty, if you're someone who has been diagnosed with herpes and you're freaking out, we do give medications called suppressive treatment where we're trying to suppress your viral shedding. In that way, you don't give it to a regular partner. And then we call you and the regular partner for counseling to see how much acceptable you are of the fact that it is such a common virus. Do you really want to be on a medication every day of your life? Just worrying that one day you might give it or spread it and things like that. So it's, it is hard, but it is doable. Um, it's a tough one. It's a tough one, Anita. That is the toughest one, I think, is to tell people that, yeah, you could still give it to people and not know that you are. I have a question I here. Um, sorry, I just have a question. So can you also transfer herpes um, orally? Yeah. So kissing yeah. somebody on the mouth, etc. Yeah, yeah. But you and that's not have symptoms on your mouth. Like you'll need to have, or it's asymptomatic. It can be asymptomatic. But you, okay. So what I'm trying to understand is that you would be needing to have an episode of herpes at that time. It's not like, so for lifelong, if you kiss somebody, you would be giving herpes if you had herpes. No, no, you don't need to have an episode to give herpes to someone. Okay. You can just quietly shed it asymptomatically. That's, that's one statement. Um, the second statement is, that's true, that it's not like anytime you kiss someone, you're going to give them herpes. But unfortunately, would I know when I'm giving someone herpes? And the answer is no, you don't, you wouldn't know. And I think, I think that's what happens. Like, you know, if, if people usually have like herpes and, you know, stuff like that, then it's obvious. Then you, then you tell people don't kiss children or, you know, don't go near them and stuff. And people are pretty, you know, uh, careful these days. However, you don't have to. And yes, if you've had it in the past sometime and you're stressed and somebody's having a baby and everybody's running around, you might still shed before you start having lesions. And actually, the truth is, Anvita, you can shed your virus 24 hours before you start having an outbreak. So let's say tomorrow you're going to have a lesion. Unfortunately, you could have started shedding a day before and you've already kissed whoever that you are kissing. So my so, question here is that um, as the partner of someone, so let's say X has um, uh, this virus that they carry and Y is the partner. Is there um, something that the partner can do to also prevent something becoming worse? Like, is there something that the other partner can do? No. So they can't actually take a preventative medic medication or something. or something? No, no. Wow. No. Yeah, yeah, it is wow. And I think it's, that's, that's hard. It's, and I think I, it's, the I, hardest, I like... it's the hardest counseling I have in my profession. Oh, wow. And sometimes people <laughs> look at me like, you're useless. You haven't found anything. I'm like, true. If anybody finds something for herpes and spread of herpes i think we'll make a million bucks but um, yeah you might not know the answer to this question and you might but just in case we've scared the world what is the percentage of people who get herpes like so the percentage of people who have type 1 herpes in a in a good population is over 60% in the okay. world and genital herpes like how many get genital like i know the oral herpes type 1 so the type 2 herpes, which is the genital herpes, is less. It's probably 40%. It's not as much. But the type 1 herpes nowadays coming in the genital area because of the lot of oral sex and everything is much more than how much type 2 comes in the genital area. So type 1 actually is present more than 50% of the times in the genital area, while type 2 is lesser than that. See, the bottom line here is Yes, it is there. And yes, we are going to face it every day in and day out. And it is not the end of the world. There are treatments available. There are doctors like us sitting and telling you how it's not the end of the world, honestly. And land cold sores and herpes and, you know, they've been around for such a long time. You know, they've been around for such a long time. And yes, you know, when people are sexually active and they're reading about it and they're knowing, oh my God, am I going to give this to, or am I... In all honesty, yes, you are, but that's okay because it has been around for so long. It's like telling like, I, I don't want to get a flu. I'm never going to get into a train because somebody is going to sneeze. 
it's that common though. Uh, sometimes I do feel it's easily said and done, but in all honesty, it's not that bad. I'm sorry. I think self-pleasure is the way forward. It <laughs> saves lives. Hashtag self-pleasure saves lives. I'm going to do a video on this. Hashtag self-pleasure saves lives. Um, so tell me, sorry, I know Anvita, yeah. you're going to ask something, but I just want to quickly ask, is yeah. there a role that a condom can play in this? Yes, it, condom prevents it 80% of the times. So your condom prevents from most STIs 80% of the time. So yes, definitely use condoms and it prevents you against most STIs. The reason I'm not saying it's going to prevent herpes 100% is because herpes is a skin virus. It's not a virus that comes to the ejaculate. Like for example, if it's like gonorrhea or chlamydia or, you know, or HIV that comes through the ejaculate, then you say you drape a condom, you know, you're 99% protected. But for two viruses one is the wart virus the hpv and the other is the herpes virus these two are skin viruses it comes from skin to skin rubbing so yes because you're covering like you know a bit of your genital area the chance is lesser but there's still a chance that you could get herpes even if you use condoms 100 percent of the times yeah. unfortunate but true Seema. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. I was just going to say, it's going to take me a while to wrap my head around this. I think, Anvita, you're right. We've probably scared the population out there into, um, I don't know, something. <laughs> like, well, I think it's scared. See, I, I think in a way we scared them in a good way because that now people are going to be have to be careful about using condoms because it's going to prevent, you know, 80%. And I think people are also going to be very diligent about going and getting themselves tested and asking these questions to the doctors and, you know, stuff like that. So I think it's a good thing. A little bit of fear with what, you know, youngsters are doing is very good. I think I'm, you're so right. And I really think that just taking away a lot of the learning from here, because a lot of it is very new for me as well. Um, and actually taking away a good amount of understanding is, I think, one of the best things you can do to prevent problems. Yeah, that's right. And I'm thinking that part of, I think, what you're also doing is normalizing it in some way, yeah. saying that, you know, yeah. a lot of people have it. It's a common virus. You know, even what we're hearing about COVID, it's asymptomatic before, yeah. it's not causing yeah. hospitalizations. It's going to become a common yeah. cold. So in some yeah. ways, it's, the problem is that we don't speak about sexually transmitted infections because they've got to do with the genitals and sex. That's and right. Everything. That's right. Um, so it's normalizing it. And so what I can say for this video is that the ones that we started with, the first, well, yeast infections are not sexually transmitted infections, but they are in the vagina but uh, thing. And herpes are both common and we are normalizing it saying it happens go seek help if you are in uk or london there are a lot of clinics called the gum clinics which work with um sexual health so you can go to them and they will test you um if you are in australia obviously there are doctors yeah we have sexual and reproductive health clinics everywhere every state every city has it you just have to you know google it and you will find them they are all publicly funded so and you don't need to have be a citizen or medicare card so anybody from travelers to students it's accessible to anyone and my yeah. and my point is going to be that i want parents out there who are listening in to please take this on board and be there for your kids because in india there may not be that many sexual health clinics that are accessible to young people yeah. and as parents you need to stop being judgy you can be upset that maybe your child is sexually active when they shouldn't be but for god's sakes don't close the door on them this is the time where you have to say, okay, come to me, let's get you help. This is not the time yeah. to say, oh my God, you've destroyed me. What will the neighbors say? That's right. And you can easily go, as in, please do make that trip to the doctor, even if it is your regular GP or a gynecologist or somebody, because it is very hard to self-treat sexually transmitted infections you know it's not a headache it's not so please do go to a doctor and get that swab or get it tested because that will lead to the right course of treatment 
Um, so I, I think we've had done enough for the first one. Um, and maybe I was going to say as that's... a series. And next time we can, you know, speak about HPV and chlamydia and others. Um, and then we can do one on contraceptions and basically the yep. king of contraception condoms. And I was going to say there's a lot to take in over here. And I think I'd like people to go away and actually sort of really ingest this and work on it in their head, try and come to a real understanding of it. And I think we should cover this in a couple of um, sessions. Yes, Navedita, we can't thank you enough. Um, really, thank you. <laughs> for, I think also bringing so much understanding to both Anvita and me because there were there are so many questions that have been answered today for us as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I think we slightly did mention about BV as well, which is, again, one very common infection, which is not an STI. So I feel like we covered, you know, three different things. So that's that's good. Definitely. And we will come back to a whole thing, like Anvita said, on contraception, particularly my hero, the condom and the hero in the lube. So I yeah. think we'll come back yes. to that at another yes. time for sure. <laughs> Yes, meantime, absolutely. Let's let's do, let's do it. I think that group chat is good that we've started. So let's just um, you know organize it and make an, you know make more sessions about this, and it'll be an absolute pleasure, actually. In the meantime, um, please stay safe. If you've enjoyed the video, if you found it useful, and I'm sure you have, do like, comment, subscribe. We will wait to hear from you what you what you'd like to hear about as well. If you need to get in touch with Anvita for any kind of consultation, Anvita is on. Anvita.madanbehel at gmail.com. If you need to get in touch with Dr. Nivedita Manokaran about any questions that you might have on STIs or contraceptions, as you can see, she really is the fount of all knowledge. Nivedita, you are on. I'm on Dr. Nivi Antabus on Instagram, and I'm very diligent with answering my DMs. My email is nivedithamanokaran at gmail.com. So feel free to email me on there. I'll try to get back to you as much as I can. That's wonderful. And I, of course, am on info.seema.anand at gmail.com for any emails that you have to send. All of these will be in the description below. So don't worry if you haven't got it. We'd like to wish you good sexual health stay safe and we'll see you over here again very soon bye